We want to see God act today. I think if I were to survey all of us, we would say, I want to see God active in my life. I teach um, interpersonal communication classes, and we know that expectations really set up happiness. Expectations about a dating relationship, roommate relationship, a class that you're in. If these expectations aren't met, then you just become disappointed. What I want to talk about is an expectation we might have about God, is when we pray that he would act in the world or in our lives, uh, what's that expectation look like? And have we minimized ways that we think God can act? I hope that you read books by professors here at Biola University. I know know we get used to being around such good thinkers, but don't take your faculty for granted. I recently read a book by John Marriott, who's one of our adjunct faculty here. He works with Biola's Center, Center for Christian Thought. It's called A Recipe for Disaster, and it has had a profound effect on this topic that we're about to talk about this morning. You know this as deconversion, that there are Christians today, particularly your generation, that are deconverting from Christianity, and some doing it very publicly via YouTube. John Marriott wrote about this in a book called The Recipe for Disaster, and this is what Marriott says. In 2001, the Southern Baptist Convention reported that they are losing between 70 and 88% of their youth after their freshman year in college. The following year, the Southern Baptist Council on Family Life also reported that 88% of children in evangelical Baptist homes leave church by the age of 18. A similar study from LifeWay Research that came out the same year claimed that 70% of students lose their faith in college, and of those, only 35% eventually return, and then 78% of those who designate themselves as being none, coming from no religious affiliation, actually came from a religious home. So Pew Research says for every one person who converts to Christianity, four deconvert. Now we have to tighten up what we mean by a Christian that is self-identified, but something's happening today. John Marriott, along with Sean McDowell, is writing a book for Zondervan continuing on this topic. I wonder if some of the reason people are deconverting is because of disappointment of praying that God would be active and present, and yet always seeing counter evidence to God being present or just being disappointed. Philip Yancey once said, you can get disappointed with God one or two ways. One, there can be a big dramatic thing that happens in your life, or it can be through a thousand disappointments. And it's the cumulative factor. I would say I'm in the thousand disappointments camp. I don't think I have a big disappointment with God, but there are ways I want him to show up that he has chosen not to show up. So the question we have to wrestle with is, where is God today in a world that seems to be spinning out of control a little bit? If you just go to your news feed, we see the pandemic, we see mass shootings in Israel, we see Ukraine, what's happening, and yet we believe that God is present, right? We believe what the psalmist believes, that great is our Lord and abundant in power and his understanding is beyond measure. So when we say abundant, what we mean by that is it's infinite, overflowing, inexhaustible, uh, profuse. So that kind of makes it worse for Christians, right? Because we know that God is all powerful, that he can act, and he has understanding. We're limited to our newsfeed. God sees it all. He sees it all 24 seven. Yet why doesn't he act in ways that are big and dramatic? Now, this morning, I'm not arguing against the supernatural. One of my dear friends, J.P. Moreland, another man you need to be reading his work, as I was writing this book, is writing a book on observing miracles in your life. So in no way, shape, or form am I arguing against the miraculous. God has done that in the past. We all have evidence of that in the present. I'm just saying in my personal life, I have prayed for some pretty dramatic things that have not been answered in the way that I want God to answer it. So does that mean that he's inactive? I want to argue he's not inactive. He is working through something we call the doctrine of common grace. Now I think part of my disappointment might be stoked by some of our worship songs. Now I love modern worship songs, but lately I've been listening to them through the lens of my disappointments. Our desire for the dramatic is understandable, perhaps stoked by some of our favorite worship songs. And the rousing song, Rattle, which I love, we hear these lyrics, my God is able to save and deliver and heal and restore anything that he wants to. 
So as a migraine sufferer who has prayed that God would take away my migraines, he hasn't, how do I rectify that with a verse that says he's able to heal, restore anything he wants to? Does that mean that God doesn't want to deal with my migraines or that my wife going through cancer treatments? Well, we have to be able to rectify God's actions Dramatic and not so dramatic. And another song famous for her, a person longs to have experiences on par with a lion's mouth being closed, standing in fire or walking through the waters. It's like the hit parade of the Old Testament. Well, I, I long for that as well, without a doubt. But look at the world that we live in. COVID deaths were approaching a million in the United States, five million in the world. 60% of Americans who were polled faced medical debt over $10,000. COVID-19 has tripled the rate of depression in U.S. adults in all demographic groups. And I work at domestic violence shelters teaching them self-defense. Uh, calls to domestic violence shelters are up over 70%. COVID has played havoc in homes that were susceptible to violence. Then add to that Ukraine. I mean, we could watch news feed of Ukraine 24-7 and it's about to get much worse. Russia has been embarrassed by the taking of Kyiv, and now they're gonna take all their forces and they're absolutely gonna limit what they're gonna do, but they're gonna do it in a devastating fashion. And we pray that God would intervene and we know that he's able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. You're not alone in questioning God. What I love about the scriptures is they give permission to ask hard questions of God. These psalmists are not rebuked for their questions, but look at what one psalmist says. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? Many of you might resonate with that. Another psalmist says, why, Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Blaise Pascal said every religion must deal with one question, the seeming hiddenness of God. Christians must deal with that as well. C.S. Lewis struggled with this. At a time when he was writing, he had written a book called Miracles, Lewis's wife uh, grew gravely ill. He prayed for healing. She went into remission. He thought she was healed. And then she came out of remission and died very suddenly. If you have never read A Grief Observed, it is C.S. Lewis's thoughts, he calls them a yell more than a thought, about the goodness of God. He wrestled with, listen to this quote. But go to him when your need is desperate, when all their help is in vain, and what do you find? A door slammed in your face and the sound of bolting and double bolting on the inside. After that, silence. You might as well turn away. The longer you wait, the more emphatic the silence becomes. And that might be some of you right now, praying and not seeing the results in a way that you want God to act. Uh, but this has been noticed by non-Christians, right? We, the book is meant, eyes to see, is meant to also, how do we talk to non-Christians about these important issues? Woody Allen once said, an atheist uh, comedian, film director, he said, if God does exist, he's certainly an underachiever. Sting, former frontman of the group Police, laments in a haunting song that if Jesus is alive, then how come he never lives here? Uh, but we're called to have answers. We're not called to just sit back and let people think about God, Christians and non-Christians. Look what Peter says. Listen, you must make Christ Lord of your life, but then if someone asks you about a hope that you have as a believer, I want you to be ready to explain it. So what I'm gonna present this morning is one sliver of the answer. It is not the entire answer. It is one sliver of common grace as an answer to how God acts. It's one way he acts. It's not the totality of how he acts. So let's make sense of God. In times of crisis, how do we expect God to act? I actually start the book with an old joke. You know this joke. Uh, oh, I'll just mention Martin Buber real quick. He said, part of our disappointment is we expect God to act in dramatic ways all the time, 24 seven, thus saith the Lord. But I start the book with a joke. Here's the joke, uh, a man gets word that there's a flood happening. He's okay, he's a Christian, God's gonna save him. Well, the flood waters come, they rise, he's in the second floor of his house. Uh, a boat comes by, says, hey, jump in the boat. He goes, no, I'm good, God's gonna save me. Now he's up on the roof, the flood waters are up there. A FEMA helicopter comes by, drops down a ladder, says, jump in. He goes, no, I'm good, God's got me. He drowns, stands before God, he's mad. He says, God, what's up? And God says, what do you want? I give you a radio message, a boat, and a helicopter. 
one laugh from James. That was like, <laughs> wow. Remind me doing dinner theater back in uh, as a theater major. Pass the salt. Excuse me, I'm doing Shakespeare. Um, but that's interesting. What was his expectation? That God would save him. Fine. How? Maybe crosswinds would hit and the waters would part from the house. Maybe a divine hand would pick him up. But what was so cool about researching the book, do you know the origins of the helicopter? Igor Sikorsky? When he's 13, he's drawing what he calls a flying boat. A boat that would come straight down, pick up people, and rescue them. Now, as an adult engineer, he forms Sikorsky Air Corps in the United States. 1930 produces the first fully functioning helicopter. Today, if you save a person's life in a Sikorsky helicopter, you get a Sikorsky pin. Hundreds of thousands of people have been saved through a helicopter. So could God be in the helicopter? If you ask Sikorsky, he'd say, absolutely. Those dreams came from God himself. He always maintained that. So is God wanting to save people? Yes, but how he does it, we can't limit him. He very well was in the boat and the brave rescue workers that were trying to save people that day. Now, let me tell you why this issue is so important to me. Uh, Before I became a a faculty at Biola University, I was on staff with CREW, Campus Crusade for Christ. I was at Miami of Ohio University in Oxford, Ohio. I had put together this huge meeting. It took a year to put together all the Christian groups on campus were going to do one massive outreach together. I was leading this meeting. We finally got a date and a time. I go out. It's uh, during winter. That's snow for some of you to understand. (laughs) I walk out. I get in my car. I turn that car. Nothing. I mean nothing. I'm like... Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, not today. No, 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 no. I literally walked back in my uh, apartment, laid, I remember this distinctly, laid face down on the floor and said, Lord, I, you got to start this car. I got to get to this meeting. You got to start this car in Jesus' name. And I walked out there, sat in that car, and I said, again, in Jesus' name, I turned that thing nothing. And I'm like, you have got to be kidding Ah, well, Vince comes in. Vince is a car geek. He's on staff with crew, and he comes in, and he goes, what's going on? You had that meeting. I know I had this meeting. My car won't start. He goes, let me go grab my tools. Gets in there. It takes him about 15 minutes. Car starts up, and I get to the meeting. I'm late, but I get to the meeting. I wanted something dramatic, right? That's actually Vince right there. I, that is not how I envisioned God to look, Right? <laughs> But is it possible God was using the skill of Vince to fix the car? I want to argue absolutely it's possible. So we, we argue for common grace. We can define common grace as the undeserved blessings God pours out on the entire human race without discrimination or bias between people. Here's the great thing about God. God could have said to the world, you want to run the world? Do it. You want to be by yourselves? Do it. Go at it. I'm done. I'm done. He didn't do that. To a world that turned their back on God, he didn't turn his back on them. He continued to give them good gifts. Uh, Christian and non-Christian, right? Uh, This is a longer definition. Grudem is particularly good on this point when it comes to common grace in your systematic theology book that many of you read. Now, I have a little bit of a disagreement. I think that common grace extends to salvation, and Grudem would stop it right there. I'm sure he's not bummed out that a former theater major disagrees with him. (laughs) But I I would take issue there. I think this common grace runs the entire table and becomes provenient grace. But Grudem is incredibly insightful when it comes to common grace, even arguing that it is totally possible non-Christians get more common grace than Christians. In other words, your non-Christian doctor could be more skilled than a Christian doctor because he or she is studying more. I love what James says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. Many commentators believe that James is looking up at the heavens, seeing the plethora of stars, and saying just as there are all these stars are all these good gifts God wants to give. Fun fact about stars, our planet resides in a galaxy known as the Milky Way, which alone has over 100,000 million stars. And there are millions of other galaxies. James' point is clear. God's good gifts are as vast and unimaginable as the stars that fill millions of galaxies. He's he's giving them to planet Earth. So our job is to recognize it. If it's happening 24-7, we need to develop eyes to see. That's based on a C.S. Lewis quote. But we need to recognize how God works. So Roger Van Eck is one of the top creativity experts in the world. He says that you often get a whack on the side of the head. You're thinking about an issue, but then you look at something totally different, and you go, oh, that's how I fix my term paper. 
Oh, that's the answer to the problem. You get a whack on the side of the head. I want to make the argument God is giving whacks on the side of the head everywhere, all across the world, giving us inventions, discovery, and insights. Let's take a look at one of them. So if you were a doctor back in the 1700s, how do you listen to a person's heartbeat? Well, you literally take your ear and put it to the chest of the person trying to hear irregularities. It didn't work great, and Rene Lenac had a rather large patient, and he couldn't hear anything. So one day he goes out for lunch, and he sees some French kids taking a long tube, uh, a metal pipe, and they're whispering in one end, and they're trying to guess what's being said, and from the reaction of the kids, they're doing a really good job. He's like, oh my goodness. He runs back to his office, takes a newspaper, rolls up the newspaper, and he can hear better. He takes metal, can hear better. He even tries wood. So the basic workings of a stethoscope, though it's changed, is really based on René Lenac. And we can't imagine a doctor's appointment without a stethoscope. See, if you went back and Google the top inventions of the ancient world, I mean, inventions that have changed how we did life, you would get a very similar list. Now, they'd rank it a little bit differently, but it'd be amazing what's on the list. There's great uniformity among historians. For example, tools would make the list, right? And now we don't have to dig with our hands. We can use tools. Agriculture, shoes, thank goodness for shoes. Uh, wheeled transportation, the control of fire. Now what's happening about all these things is they're roughly happening at the same time. I read a 75 page academic paper on the advent of fire. God bless these people. <laughs> Whoever they are, God bless every one of them. But he made the argument that um, where the first place came is of debate, but roughly at the same time, the advent of fire is happening across the world. Now under, appreciate that. There's no communication happening. Imagine an ancient Zoom meeting, right? Uh, they're, they're sitting there going, hey, what are you working on? Your feet ever hurt? Oh man, all the time, I'm stepping, we're, we're developing a shoe. A what? Uh, you froze, a shoe. We'll send you basic drawings, right? That was not happening. Yet these inventions are popping up all over the place. Is it possible God is giving a di divine whack on the side of the head, say, hey, you're gonna need fire. One, to cook. Two, to stay warm. Three, to protect yourself from animals. Now here's the sad thing about God's good gifts. Every good gift can be warped. Every good gift can be used uh, for unrighteous purposes. Fire can be used to raise a village of an enemy. Uh, my goodness, dynamite was first created for agricultural purposes, to break up hard soil so farmers could work. Well, you better believe the military took that in a heartbeat and it became one of the most devastating killing machines that we've ever seen, but God gives us these good gifts. So imagine fighting COVID without this, ventilators, N95 masks, vaccines, uh, courage of doctors and nurses, non-Christian and Christian alike, Zoom, when Zoom hit, I mean, when COVID hit, we pivoted on a dime to Zoom meetings. Now, right now, we just hate them, <laughs> but way back then, it was a lifesaver when we could continue our education. I can continue speaking at conferences via Zoom, uh, government stimulus packages, right? My, all my kids benefited from that stimulus package. Imagine the UK, Ukraine crisis without relief organizations, Red Cross, Samaritan's Purse, kindness of neighboring countries, my goodness, Poland, taking in what, 40% of the refugees? Um, NATO, the idea of NATO, uh, the idea of the UN, the idea of these things I think are God-given. Whether people recognize it or not, they're God-given. How about defensive weapons? I have a whole chapter in the book on self-defense. All across the world, there are defense systems, self-defense systems that have risen up. All, I mean, go to, throw a dart on a map and a self-defense system originated from there. Now, I got a black belt in Shaolin Kung Fu. It is a virtuous system. We are taught never to use Kung Fu uh, offensively. We're always to use it to protect, right? Never do we go after a person unless they're from Duke. Uh, technology, technology to report the war. Hey, this war is being managed via technology. The brave reporters who are literally giving their lives to show us is putting pressure on President Putin like ha didn't exist before. So this technology is one way God's helping to keep things in check because we're see the whole world's seeing the devastation and they're uniting. Uh, 
I love what C.S. Lewis said. Remember when the cosmonaut went up to space and he said in 1961, I went up in space, I did not see God. Uh, Lewis wrote to his nephew, C.S. Lewis, this response. I thought this was brilliant. To some, God is discoverable everywhere. To others, nowhere. Those who do not find him on earth are unlikely to find him in space. But send a saint up in a spaceship and he'll find God in space as he found him on earth. Much depends on the seeing eye. And that's what we need to do today. As we pray for the miraculous, we need to have a seeing eye that God is not limited to the overtly supernatural, but he's also working 24 seven in the background. So the assignment I would give you as you head into finals is cultivate the seeing eye. Sit down and say, today I'm gonna look at five things that come to me via grace. Now I get migraines. Uh, I'm part of the millions of Americans that get migraines. I once gave the most raw sermon I've ever given in my life. Uh, when, I take, when I get a migraine, I can take my medication. If it doesn't work, I have to wait two hours before I take the next dose. After the next dose, I can't take anything for 24 hours. So I had a blistering migraine, but I was preaching the next day. So I went and took my migraine medication. Nothing was happening. Now I gotta sit in a dark room for two hours. I can't listen to music, I can't lay down, everything bugs me. So I'm sitting there for two hours, I was, pre- God's sense of humor, I'm preaching on James, consider it pure joy when you encounter trials. So the title of my sermon that day was James on a Migraine. And I just sat there thinking, why would he not, and you better believe I prayed that it would take away my migraines. And, and God didn't do it that way, but guess what? I took the second after two hours and the migraine went away. And for the first time I thought, thank God for my migraine medication. Thank God for a non-Christian neurologist who has helped me in many different ways, right? I don't think it's wrong to pray that God would take away my migraines. And by the way, you know what's really annoying? I have a friend, a Christian, who prayed God would take away the migraines and did. (laughs) Right, what's the official response? Oh, praise God for you. Right, so today, look at his benefits. But don't just limit it to material benefits. I think this is a mistake we make, particularly as Americans. In other words, I'm gonna praise God for my grade point, my dating life, I get to go to this university, my family's safe, Uh, COVID's finally going away, but we forget about the spiritual. When King David says, I'm gonna count the benefits of the Lord in Psalm 103, he starts with the spiritual. All my transgressions have been forgiven. God has given me love and kindness. And then he gets to the material. I think as American Christians, we flip that and then get mad at God because the material, the car didn't start. The migraine didn't go away. But you know what's always true of me is that I'm loved by God, justified, redeemed. Um, uh, I'm a child of God adopted into his family. All right, let me close with just two things real quick. Uh, Often you write these books for yourself and hopefully you think people will find it interesting. So when I was on staff with Campus Crusade for Christ, I was the first time overseas. I was in the Mathari Valley in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, deepest poverty I've ever seen in my entire life. Um, so we would go and show the Jesus film uh, based on the Gospel of Luke. Uh, many times we went to parts of the Mathari Valley that had no le- electricity. They had never seen a film before. So we got thousands of people would come out. It was utterly amazing. So one day we were going out, three teams were going out. We go to this one place, they drop off the generator, the projector, all this different kind of stuff, and then they're off to drop off the two other teams. So now we're setting up our, project, our, our screen and literally there was gonna be a thousand people that night. It, they just came out in droves because they'd never seen a movie before. So we're about to do it. Uh, And one of my students, uh, I forget, she was from Kentucky, came up to me and said, Tim, we don't don't have the cord. We don't have the connecting cord from the generator to the projector. I was like, what? Yeah, we don't have it. So what happened was we jumped out really quick and and we didn't grab it. So now we're like, oh my goodness. She says to me, and don't ever quote professor to a professor. Like I always say to my students, don't quote me to me, right? She says to me, didn't you just give this devotion this morning out of Ephesians 3.20, God is able to do exceedingly abundantly all we think? I said, yeah. She goes, I say, let's pray and turn on that projector. I wanted to say, that is the dumbest idea. (laughs) But I did not say that. As a Campus Crusade for Christ person, I did not say that. I said, yes, 
Absolutely. So we hold hands, we are around this projector, and we are praying, and I'm thinking, man, oh man, I'm thinking back to a car on a snowy Ohio day, and I'm holding hands, just as she's, I, I promise, people say to me, do you make up these stories? I do not make up these stories. Uh, just as she is saying amen, I hear a car flying down the road. Because you know what happened. He dropped off group two, dropped off group three, and there's an extra cord. He goes, oh my gosh, it's got to be two or one. So he goes flying back to two. They've got it. Now it's got to be Mielhaus group. They fly back and literally rolls on the window, throws me a cord. <laughs> I plug it in, and literally about 100 people came to faith that night. Now, I had been haunted by that forever. Why? Because, I'm just going to be honest with you, would that have turned on? How many of you would say, theoretically, yes, it could have turned on? Show of hands. Got as powerful enough to turn on that projector without electricity? Show of hands. We got work to do because there's only like 20 people raise their hand. <laughs> Take note, we got some work to do. Okay, yes, theoretically, yes, I would say yes. Can God take away my migraines? Absolutely can take away my migraines. Can God turn on that projector without electricity? Yes, theoretically. But then here's what I've thought about since writing the book. If you were to go to ancient Christians and say to ancient Christians, hey, what would you think of an all-terrain vehicle? What would you think of a projector that can emit light onto a screen and show a moving picture I think ancient Christians would have said, what, what? Well, I took all of that for granted and that kind of haunted me. Now I'm less haunted by that. A am I still disappointed by the car in Ohio? I would say yes, I'm still disappointed by that. Am I disappointed he's not taking away my migraines? Yes, but James tells me, consider it joy, not happiness, but joy that the migraines are these reflective moments where God is saying to me, Tim, if, I don't, if there's no speed bump in your path, you're gonna double productivity. You're gonna try to double it. And that is not good for you. So these migraines are God's ways of kind of, I, I think of him allowing it to slow me down a little bit and have these interesting introspective prayers where the Holy Spirit is saying, I think, you, I think you're too hurried. I think you're too busy. And I'm like, mm, uh, maybe, you know, kind of a response. So let me pray for you. Uh, let me pray that today, in the midst, I love what James said, uh, all my students, I mean, it's the end of the semester, we're all just frazzled. We're all just tired, frazzled. But even in the midst of the craziness, even in the midst of, of being frazzled and tired, we could still stop and say, but I'm going to thank God for Talbot Chapel. Why don't we start there? Thank God that people take time, energy, the tech person in the back, the camera person, worship leaders, Daniel, Kim, who gives leadership to this. Let's stop and just say, thank you for chapel. I mean, sometimes you're like, do I gotta go to chapel? But <laughs> hey, let's praise God we go to a school that we can go to chapel, and then the rest of the day, let's pick four more. We already got one, Talbot. Now let's go, and maybe walk up to your next professor, walk up and say, hey, thank you for this class, the time and energy that you put into it. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.